again everyone it's dr. B back and we're uh, gonna as the slide says we're talking about data movement instructions today and um, assuming we're still following the same book as when I recorded this this is actually your first time seeing inst assembly instructions in the wild um, so let's kind of get started and, and talk about um, what some of these are uh, the first and arguably the most important here are the uh, basic load and store instructions. And I'm going to motivate this with a, a little example. So our problem is we have two uh, memory locations. Uh, they each have some data in them, uh, both both unbit unsigned integers, and uh, we want to add those two things together. So uh, we we're going to set it up to where the data at 3A84 is going to be added to the integer at C097, and that we're going to put the result back in A100. So data has to come from two places, the result has to be put back somewhere, and, and so we've laid that all out here. Let's see how the data moves through the system. So recall that we have the arithmetic logic unit and this is where our addition is going to occur. That's the, the hardware that does the addition, among other things. Uh, and we also have our accumulator register. And they call it the accumulator because it accumulates the results of operations. So step one, we're going to load the contents of our first operand, 3A84, which is 42, directly into the accumulator. Step two, we're going to grab the contents of C097, feed them to the arithmetic logic unit, and also feed the contents of the accumulator into the arithmetic logic unit. So because of that, our 42 from before is going to be added to our 64 from this memory location, and the result is once again going to be placed in the accumulator, 106. Finally, we're going to take that result and store it to our result address, which we decided would be A100. So we write a 106 there. So let's summarize those steps and kind of look at the, how the assembly will, will fall out. So we load contents of 3A84 into the accumulator, step one. Step two, we add the contents of C097, and the result will also be placed into the accumulator. Then we store the result, in other words, take what is in the accumulator and store it back to A100. So in assembly, step one, load into the accumulator from address 3A84. So that's what LDA means. Step two, Add with a carry, ADC, the contents of C097. And again, that will uh, place the result into the accumulator. Step three, store the results to A100. So we do that with an STA, um, aka store accumulator, to A100. So a three step process to do what, uh, to add two memory contents together. So to summarize, we have load instructions. So load instructions, uh, with a couple of exceptions, grab data from memory and place it into a register. So here, LDA, load accumulator, 4000, loads the contents of, of that address, 4000, into the accumulator. We also have a version that can load the contents of an address into the X register with LDX. There's also an LDY that does the same thing, except for the Y register. In the next video, or next lecture, we're going to talk about something called addressing modes. And I want to point out that this is the, an example of what we call absolute addressing, meaning that we uh, load from an absolute memory location into uh, a register. complementary to the the load instructions is the the store instructions so 
We also have a store accumulator, STA. It stores directly to a memory address in this form. We have a store X, so stores the contents of the uh, X register to a memory location. And we have a store Y that does the same thing, but again, for the, the Y register. All right, let's move on to the stack. Now, probably are not going to do much direct manipulation of the stack in this course. Uh, it's, you know, the, we just probably won't need to. However, I do want to talk about the hardware stack because it touches on things you will see in other courses. Um, for one thing, you, you talk about the stack as a data structure in your, in your data structures course. And um, so you'll, you'll see it there. Um, most of you have already seen it in CS1. Uh, we, you know, at least in, in, in passing, because almost all of you have gotten something called a stack overflow error. And uh, that comes directly from the, the, the stack related concepts. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So again, not probably not going to do much programming with the stack, but I want you to see it and, and see how the hardware stack relates to, to some of these other issues you see in other courses. So first of all, abstractly, what is a stack? Uh, it is a data structure where the elements are stacked on top of one another. And we place a restriction on the stack that only the element at the top can be accessed at any given time. Anything farther down in the stack is effectively hidden from us as programmers and developers. Um, and we actually place this restriction on ourselves. There's nothing that says we have to. We place this restriction on ourselves uh, because it allows us to do certain kinds of algorithms uh, well. We call this a first in, last out data structure. So here, and here we have an example. I have three things in my stack. Uh, Akita is at the is at the bottom, so we can't access that. A doggo is on top of that, and bird is at the very top of the stack. So right now, bird is the only thing really we can manipulate on the stack. We have two operations we can we can do with a stack, and the first is called a push. So a push simply puts something else onto the top of the stack. So taking my stack example from the previous slide, where top is currently po pointing to my bird element, I can push SNEC onto it. And now this is uh, SNEC is on top. The top points to that. And bird, doggo, and kitta are uh, below it and currently unavailable to us. The opposite of a push is a pull. So in a pull, we take the top element off and usually do something with it. Um, so taking, once again, our stack from the previous slide, with snack at the top, if we do a pull, it pulls that snack off and then sets the top to be the next thing down, in this case, bird. Um, and uh, as the note says, most texts these days refer to pull as a pop. That is kind of, since that book has been written, uh, pop has kind of become the more common term to use here. So just keep that in mind. Now, why do we talk about the stack when we're, we're looking at the, the 6502? Uh, it, like most uh, computer processors, has a hardware stack. Uh, in the 6502, this is a reserved memory area starting at address 0100 and going to 01FF. And if you do the math, that is 256 bytes. It is what we call a top-down stack, meaning the, the bottom element of the stack is at the highest address, 10FF. We have a special register, SP, for stack pointer, that help us, helps us keep track of where that top of stack is. Um, at any given time, SP contains the address of the next available stack location. So it doesn't contain the address of the current top of stack. It is the actual, it's the address of what would be the next top of stack if we were to push something onto it. We have a couple of, of uh, instructions for manipulating the stack. PHA means to push the accumulator's value onto the stack. 
PLA means to pull the uh, pull the stack's top element and place it into the accumulator. Uh, we can there's also a couple of others where we can uh, push and pull the status register byte to and from the stack. But then that's where it ends. We can't push or pull the, the X or Y registers uh, directly. So some weirdnesses about how we, we look at the stack pointer on the 6502. Uh, it is an 8-bit register. Now, stack pointer is actually keeping track of an address, and addresses are 16 bits, 2 bytes. So how are we getting a 2-byte address when we're only storing one byte of it? And the answer is that stack is between 0100 and 01FF. Well, notice 01 is common to all of these addresses. So that part is implied. We're only storing in the stack pointer the last byte here. We're only storing the low byte. So if we want to find out the actual address for the stack pointer, sometimes called the effective address, uh, we take the value in the stack pointer and add 0100 to it. So here's a good test question. If SP contains uh, hex 6a, what is the actual stack pointer address or the effective stack pointer address? And of course the answer is 016a because we add 0100 to it. All right, so let's look at um, stack operations from the, the hardware's point of view. We're going to do this with an example. So we're going to assume that our stack is empty. And when our stack is empty, the stack pointer is FF, pointing to address 01 FF. And remember, the stack pointer points to the next available stack slot. Let's push something onto it. Uh, Remember, we can only push things from the accumulator, so we're going to load something into the accumulator first, and we're going to push the accumulator to the stack. So we loaded 42 in, we pushed 42 to the stack, the stack pointer automatically moves to the next available location. So now it is stack pointer is FE, which points to the address 01 FE. We push something else. So we push 64 onto the stack by loading 64 into the accumulator, pushing it to the pushing the accumulator to the stack. 64 goes in what was the previous stack pointer address. Now the stack pointer has moved to the next available slot. It's FD, which translates into 01 FD as an address. Let's push one more thing. So we're loading 101 into the accumulator. And we're going to push the accumulator to the stack. So my stack was it, stack pointer was at FD. It's now moved to FC, and FD contains the value that I pushed. Now let's pull. So the very last thing I want to do, I'm executing a PLA, so pull and place into accumulator. So it pulled what was in my, my previous top of stack. I'm sorry. Yeah, the previous top of stack was here. It moved the stack pointer down, but didn't change what was in memory. So now the stack pointer is simply pointing to the next available slot, meaning this is really invalid. And what was there was loaded into the accumulator. So the accumulator will now have 101. So stack pointer does not zero this out in any way. Um, it just, because it now points to this location, that means FD here is the... Um, what will be used for the next push. So let's just talk a few slides about why we need a stack. And, and the first thing I want to do is go back to Computer Science 1 and, and look at some things we did in Java. Um, what you have to understand is that when we call a method from within another method, the method that's doing the calling its context is saved to the stack. And by context, we mean um, the values in all its parameters, the values in any local variables, as well as what we call the return address. The address uh, that method was, was currently executing at the time it called the next method. And we're going to represent here that address as simply a line number. 
So for example, this build analogy method, one of the things it does is it calls build pair here, which is a different method. When that happens, all the parameters in build analogy are going to be saved to the stack, as will return address, again, which I'm just showing as a line number, but it's actually an address uh, in memory. That will be placed in the stack. And then we immediately jump to executing this build pair method. When build pair is done, it's going to pop the context of build analogy back off the stack. And that context gives us everything we need to do to recreate build analogy as it was at this point in time. All our parameters get their values back, and we have this return address, or line number in this case, but it's a return address, to tell us where we need to continue executing from. And these call stacks can get very, very deep. So every time we call a method, well, that next method may call a method, and that next method may call a method, and that next method may call a method. So these uh, context, contexts get start piling up in our stack. And in Java, we have a very large stack available to us because it's memory-based, uh, not hardware-based. But um, you know, we th these things pack pile up so that every time a method returns, we know exactly what it can return to. Now, sometimes this process fails, and you've seen you've probably seen this. You get something called a stack overflow error. Um, a very um, easy to view variant of this is a method that calls itself. Now, there are uh, times, and, and if you've taken computer science too, which you should have, uh, you've talked about recursion. Um, this is recursion done poorly, and actually recursion done incorrectly. Um, you can do recursion correctly by having a method call itself. Um, this is not that. This is going to infinitely call itself. Get name is going to call get name, which calls get name, which calls get name, which calls get name, and it just keeps doing that over and over and over infinitely. Every time get name calls itself, it pushes a copy of its context to the stack. And eventually the stack runs out of data, out of space to hold all of that, and we in Java throws a stack overflow error. Again, you have probably seen this before. Some of you have maybe even made this mistake, and that's okay. We, we, we got you sorted out. Um, but now you have a little bit of sense of what's happening when you get a, a stack overflow error like this. Now, let's take this back to an assembly perspective. Um, 6502 assembly, as most um, assembly languages will, has a context of a subroutine. Um, and a subroutine is a method-like construct. It's just a lot simpler. Uh, most of them don't even have parameters, uh, like, like, just like in 6502. Um, there is a context when you're looking at assembly code. Uh, for 6502, that context is the contents of the AX and Y registers, the context of the program counter, which becomes your return address, and the contents of the status register. And to do a, a full uh, push of a context to the stack, you would put all these things in there. And we can use that for when we call subroutines, and those call subroutines, and those call subroutines. We push all those things to the stack, and then we can pop them off as needed to return our program to the state it was in before the call. Um, final note, most of, most of your CPUs have a hardware stack built in. Um, Languages like C and C++ that compile directly to machine code, uh, meaning the they compile first to assembly and then that assembly is, is assembled into machine code. Um, most of those are going to use the hardware stack directly if it's available. Um, and most modern computer processors are actually op have a very well optimized uh, program stack. Um, I've got to note, I don't know if, if interpreted languages like Java and Python use the hardware stack directly, um, but they will have a at least have a software-based stack that is going to use these same principles. So if you understand it at the assembly level, you should be able to understand it at the Java level and vice versa. All 
all right uh, well not the last thing but um, close to the last thing uh, let's have some we we'll talk about some instructions that transfer between between registers and these are them very simply um, transfer from accumulator to a, the X register transfer from accumulator to Y transfer from X to a transfer from Y to the accumulator uh, and uh, as the yellow box says this is an example of implied addressing none of these take an address none of them take a, an implied or any kind of thing it the instruction is simply that and no more and let's look at how you can can use these so my example is I'm going to add two 16-bit numbers together now the the basic add instruction in in job or in uh, 6502 assembly only adds an 8-bit two 8-bit values together but we can chain several add instructions to do a 16-bit add and we're going to use um, both the A and the X register to do that in this case so our program begins we don't care what's in the in the accumulator we don't care what's in the X register um, we don't care what's in the status register but we're going to later so that's why I have status register and index at the C bit because we want we're interested in what the carry is going to look like in a minute so for starts, we're going to clear the carry bit. We're going to add the low byte, uh, transfer to X, and do the high bytes. Let's go through these step by step. So first of all, clear the carry. And when we do that, we ensure that the carry bit is zero. That's going to be important in a minute. Next thing we do, we're going to load an immediate value of hex 34 into our accumulator. So we're going to do the low byte first. So that goes into the accumulator. We're going to add the low byte of our other operand to it. So we're going to add uh, hex CD. And when we do that, we're going. it's actually going to wrap around and give us a uh, value of 01 in my accumulator. And it's going to set the carry bit. This is important. Now we're going to take what's in the accumulator and transfer it to X. So we took what's in the accumulator, we actually copy it to X. Notice it didn't change what's in the accumulator. You sometimes have to remember that. Now we're going to work on adding the high bytes together. So we're going to load into the accumulator the high byte of our first operand, one uh, hex one two. Oops, sorry about that. And we're going to add into it the high byte of our other operand, which is a b. When we do that, it's not only going to. Um, whoops, sorry. Let's go that one. So we add in our, our high byte. I'm, I got ahead of myself. That gives me a value of b e. Well, if you pull out your calculator and add hex 1, 2 to hex A, B, it'll actually give you B, D. Yes, you got to think backwards there. Um, but we have B, E here. And the reason is it also added in our carry from the previous um, addition. Uh, we do that because the carry carries over into the next uh, column of addition. Well, the carry from this got added into this column as well when the B and the 2 were added together. Um, notice this also set, set the carry back to 0 because uh, hex 1, 2 plus hex AB plus 1 for the carry um, does not carry out itself. Um, once this is done, our final uh, answer uh, of adding these two 16-bit uh, values together is A with the high byte, X with the low byte, so BE01. All right, uh, last thing for today is just some what we call syntactic sugar. So these are not actual um, parts of assembly, but they make our, our, our process of writing assembly a lot easier. So using the, the code uh, from the previous example, let's start by talking about the less than and greater than shortcuts. 
So if you remember in the previous example, uh, when I added the low byte first, I had to be explicit about 3, 4, and CD here. Well, using um, the less than operator, when it is applied to a constant value, like 1, 2, 3, 4, it says just give me the low byte, in this case 3, 4. So applied to the constant A, B, C, D, it gives me the low byte, which is CD. On the other hand, we have the greater than operator, which when used with a constant, gives the high bytes, respectively. These only work for 16-bit constants, and we have to understand they're not technically a simpler code. They're just some um, things that uh, CBM PRG Studio gives us to, to make our code a little more readable, a little, a little easier to work with. We can build on top of these with the, something called named constants. So named constants are um, roughly equivalent to your public static final constants in Java. Uh, they are constants, they're not variables, but we can use them uh, in our code again to make things a little more readable. So again, so to go back to the previous example, we're adding hex one, two, three, four, hex A, B, C, D. Let's name them val1 and val2 respectively. So now we can LDA the low byte of val1, add it to the low byte of val2, transfer, and then we can, when we do our high bytes, we can add the high byte of val1 to the high byte of val2. Again, these are um, these are specific as far as I know to, to CB and PRG Studio, but you can use them to make your, your job a little easier. Um, notice that Note that these will not grab the low and high bytes out of an existing memory address or, or register or anything like that. It can only work on constants or, or named constants themselves. All right, that is it for today. As always, uh, please let me know if you have questions and I will be glad to help.